while incarcerated at HMP Park in Bridgend, Wales. Inmate Harry Pullen was reported to have had inappropriate relationships with two female prison workers. Pullen was handed a five-year sentence in 2019 for his role in a drug network that trafficked heroin and cocaine in South Wales. He was given a further four years and nine months when he was caught smuggling a cell phone in his backside during a prison transfer. 26-year-old guard Ruth Schmilo and 25-year-old nurse Elise May Hibbs were accused of having flirtatious phone conversations with Pullen, who was known in the system as a particularly manipulative individual. A number of inmates and staffers had made reports about Schmilo and Pullen, who were in communication between December of 2020 and April of 2021, while the former was in a probationary period at the prison. Schmilo was terminated and she went to trial after being accused of not reporting Pullen's advances and actively engaging in the illicit relationship. She was eventually found not guilty in 2023. Schmilo revealed that her phone conversations with Pullen had occurred because she was afraid of him. He made threats to actually harm me. If I had a partner, he would kill me and them, threatened to come to my house with my family, threatened to hot water my brother-in-law to harm my cats. Schmilo said in court, the guard claimed that she couldn't officially report him due to her being seen as a whistleblower by her superiors after she had complained about guards tampering with the prisoner's food. While Schmilo was cleared of having a relationship with Pullen, the same couldn't be said of Hibbs. The nurse had met the inmate while treating him and they became romantically involved. The duo communicated on Instagram through an account held by a friend of Pullen's. They exchanged love declarations and spoke about having a future together. Hibbs was arrested a week after quitting her job at HMP Park in July of 2021. She accepted that she got in too deep and couldn't get out with Pullen and admitted misconduct in a public office. In 2022, she was jailed for six months and in 2023, she was suspended from her medical profession for 12 months. Number 17. Charlene Diane O'Banion in the fall of 2021, while employed at the Conroe Montgomery County Jail in Texas, Deputy Charlene Diane O'Banion had physical relations with 28-year-old Jacob Parker. The woman, who was at the time in her early 30s, volunteered for cleaning duties in a section of the jail known as B-Quad in order to rendezvous with Parker. While in a secluded area, she performed an intimate act on him. The tryst eventually came to light and O'Banion was subsequently interrogated by detectives from the Montgomery County Sheriff's Office in December of 2021. The video recorded interview went viral. At first, O'Banion fully denied having had contact with Parker, dismissing it as a rumor started by an inmate. In reality, she and Parker had not only been physical, but also regularly talked on the phone. When Detective Tom Landry revealed that all their jailhouse calls had been recorded, O'Banion admitted that she and Parker had been involved, but claimed that it happened years prior before she worked at the jail and he was an inmate. Landry then pointed out that based on one recorded conversation, it was rather obvious that they'd been intimate recently. O'Banion continued denying that aspect, but Landry then played her a recording in which from the onset, she and Parker referred to each other as babe. They then discussed having relations in graphic detail, including the incident that had taken place inside the jail. The inmate at one point even complimented O'Banion on her performance, to which she replied, it wasn't my best moment, I was just trying to get it done, before admitting that she still got aroused thinking about it. Even after hearing her own voice on the recording, O'Banion tried to manipulate the story but ultimately admitted that she'd performed the act on Parker in recent months. Before the interrogation concluded, the woman asked, am I going to jail? But the detective told her it wasn't his decision. In the aftermath, O'Banion pleaded guilty to improper activity with a person in custody and in May of 2022, she was sentenced to 100 days in jail. Number 16. Aisha Goldsby In August of 2023, former prison worker Aisha Goldsby was jailed for 16 months 
at Bournemouth Crown Court after she'd admitted to several crimes stemming from her romance with an inmate. The Englishwoman was 19 years old in 2020 when she began working as a guard at HMP Portland in Dorset. While there, she started a relationship with 21-year-old Dino Harrison, who was doing time for drug dealing and robbery. Goldsby fell in love with Harrison and expressed her feelings for him while they messaged each other on Instagram. Harrison reciprocated her affection. The relationship never became physical and it mainly unfolded over phone communication. With nearly a dozen calls logged between them in January of 2022, Goldsby knew that Harrison had a phone in his cell and, while she reported other inmates to her superiors for such items, she didn't do so in his case. Moreover, she tipped him off when searches were carried out so that he could conceal the phone. The device was eventually found on January the 28th, which also led to the discovery of the illicit romance. The guard was arrested in the aftermath. In court, Gulby's defense attempted to persuade the judge to give her a suspended sentence, arguing that she was a hard-working young woman with no priors who was remorseful of her own stupidity. Judge Jonathan Fuller, however, argued that misconduct in the prison service should be dealt with seriously and opted for the custodial sentence. Number 15. Rachel Martin an English corrections officer was inappropriately involved with an inmate under her supervision from November the 1st of 2020 to February the 8th of 2021. Following an eight-week period of training, Rachel Martin began working at HMP Guy Marsh in January of 2020. As part of her preparation for the job, she was ironically instructed on how to avoid being cornered and manipulated by inmates. The 25-year-old's romance with prisoner Raymond Abraham began within months of her starting the job. She and Abraham, who had a phone hidden in his cell, exchanged hundreds of calls and thousands of WhatsApp messages, which were often explicit in nature. In December of 2020, they expressed their love for each other. Abraham was in his 40s at the time of their tryst and a hardened criminal. He was serving a 10-year sentence for being part of a gang that targeted ATM machines stealing over £100,000. During their communication, Martin sent Abraham photos in various states of undress and at one point boasted to a friend that he paid all of her bills. An analysis of their transactions, which had been carried out through various tertiary parties, revealed that the guard had received at least £12,000 from the inmate which she spent on electrical goods, clothes, and various high-value items. On February the 3rd of 2021, Martin was subjected to a random search, at which point a remote-controlled adult toy was found in her possession. A few days later, Abraham's cell was searched with staff discovering a cell phone, USB sticks, and a memory card. The devices contained compromising photos of Martin. Women's underwear were also found under the inmate's pillow. Martin's relationship with Abraham resumed after she quit her job on February the 8th and up until her arrest on April the 1st. During the legal proceedings that followed, her defense argued that the inmate had groomed her, preying on her youthful naivety and vulnerability following a recent breakup. Martin admitted nine offenses of misconduct for which she was sentenced to 16 months in prison in February of 2023. Number 14. Kayla Bergham In April of 2022, janitor Kayla Bergham was arrested for having engaged in relations with an inmate at Tama County Jail in Iowa on multiple occasions over the course of seven months. Another employee tipped the authorities off to the illicit affair. An investigation revealed that 27-year-old Bergham and the unnamed 29-year-old inmate had been intimate at least once in a utility closet and at least twice in the recreation yard. Between September of 2020 and April of 2021, Bergham was taken into custody in April of the following year and charged with three counts of misconduct with an offender. She resigned from her job at the jail in the incident's wake. In May of 2022, Bergham pleaded not guilty to all the charges leveled against her, for which she faced a maximum of six years in prison. Number 13. 
Christopher Rollin, Kirk Walton, Ronald Connor, and Jeremy Godbolt. On February the 14th of 2022, inmate Ronald Jean Ingram was set to be transferred from the mental health unit at the Dade Correctional Institution to the Lake Correctional Institution in Central Florida. As 60-year-old Ingram was removed from his cell, he reportedly threw his urine on a correctional officer. Surveillance footage then showed Ingram walking on his own as he was escorted by two officers. Not long afterwards, in another CCTV video, he was seen dragging his feet and being carried to the transport van by correctional staff. Ingram was placed in a secure compartment in the van, where he was eventually found dead after the transfer vehicle had made a stop in Ocala. A medical examiner determined that he'd succumbed to internal bleeding, stemming from a punctured lung, also noting that he had injuries on his face and torso that indicated he'd been severely beaten. Four correctional officers were arrested in the aftermath on suspicion of having attacked Ingram in an area of the jail that didn't feature any surveillance cameras. They were named as Christopher Rollin, Ronald Connor, and Jeremy Godbolt, all three in their 20s along with 34-year-old Kirk Walton. The four were believed to have beaten a handcuffed Ingram and inflicted the injuries that ended his life in retaliation for him throwing urine on one of them. Rollin, Connor, Godbolt and Walton faced a multitude of charges that included second-degree murder, conspiracy, aggravated battery of an elderly adult, and cruel treatment of a detainee. Number 12. Jennifer Parker From 2010 until she resigned in August of 2014, Jennifer Parker was the head cook at the St. Lawrence County Jail in New York. Following an investigation into her conduct while she was employed at the prison, Parker was arrested on over a dozen charges that stemmed from her abusing the inmates under her supervision. 43-year-old Parker admitted that she'd had relations with two inmates in 2011 and 2012, as well as to forcibly touching another inmate in 2014. As per state laws, inmates were considered incapable of consent while under the supervision and control of a jail employee. Parker's lawyer would later argue that as a matter of fact and a matter of common sense, the men shouldn't be regarded as victims. While the charges against her initially focused on the forced nature of her crimes, Parker eventually pleaded guilty to lesser charges that included official misconduct. In 2019, she was sentenced to serve weekends in prison for several months, was given 10 years probation, and had to register with the state as a level two offender. Number 11. Megan Woodham Three people were jailed for a total of 34 years in January of 2023 after they were found guilty of conspiracy to smuggle drugs into HMP Risley in Warrington, Cheshire, England. Between December of 2021 and February of 2022, Megan Woodham had been employed as a health worker at the prison. Investigators determined that the 30-year-old had formed some sort of relationship with drug baron Daniel Doran while he was incarcerated at HMP Risley. The man had over a dozen offenses on his record at the time, with the vast majority of them being drug-related. He reportedly had access to a cell phone behind bars at Risley and used it to coordinate the distribution of massive amounts of high-purity cocaine and ketamine. Not only did Woodham, a mother of one, bring drugs into HMP Risley for Doran, but she also allowed her home to become a safe house for a lucrative and wider-reaching trafficking operation. The investigation into the matter had begun in January of 2022 with the arrest of Doran's cousin, John Butler. Law enforcement stopped him as he was driving a black Volkswagen through Netherton. Butler was visibly shaken when questioned by officers, who then searched the vehicle and found a bag containing 22 pounds of cocaine with an estimated street value of well over a million dollars. Butler was arrested and his phone was seized. Investigators examined the device and thus discovered the overarching conspiracy. On December the 14th of 2021, Doran had texted his cousin giving him Woodham's home address and tasked him with collecting money and moving drugs. A few days later, Doran messaged another co-conspirator, 27-year-old Kelsey Higgins, to arrange for him to handle the delivery of the 22-pounds bag. 
A text from January the 2nd then indicated that the drug baron had asked him to move an additional parcel. The next day, Wooden was captured by surveillance cameras alone and carrying a bag in a wing of the prison where Doran was housed. She wouldn't have typically been expected to access the area unaccompanied. Her main duty at the prison was to perform blood tests for inmates, but Doran was not scheduled to receive one on that day. Footage showed Woodham approaching his cell and leaning into it with investigators, later suspecting she'd done so in order to pass him a package of drugs. Texts regarding drug drops and deliveries continued between them and their co-conspirators in the days that followed. Butler was jailed for eight years in February of 2022 after admitting to possession with intent to supply Class A drugs. Doran, Higgins and Woodham were all arrested on Valentine's Day 2022. The latter was found guilty of conspiracy to supply cocaine and ketamine. The disgraced health worker told her family that she loved them as they sat in a public gallery during her sentencing at Liverpool Crown Court in January of 2023, when Woodham was jailed for six years. Doran and Higgins were sentenced to 15 years and 13 and a half years respectively for conspiracy to supply Class A drugs. Number 10. Andres Salazar A detention officer was arrested in Maricopa County, Arizona in January of 2023 on suspicion of having smuggled drugs into Lower Buckeye Jail. Sheriff Paul Penzone told the media during a conference in Phoenix that 26-year-old Andres Salazar had coordinated with an inmate to get roughly 100 pills of fentanyl into the jail. Penzone noted that Salazar's actions had not only tainted the reputation of those working at Lower Buckeye, but could have also endangered the lives of those incarcerated. The synthetic opioid was known to be up to 50 times more potent than heroin and 100 times stronger than morphine, and a significant factor in the rise of drug-related deaths in the US. Investigators found that it was Salazar's first attempt of trafficking contraband inside the correctional facility and that he'd been paid $1,000 to do so. Investigative efforts into his activity had been ongoing for roughly a month, and deputies moved in for the arrest once they'd gathered enough evidence. They intercepted Salazar in the jail's parking lot and took him into custody. He was charged with possession of a narcotic, promoting prison contraband and transport for sale. Number 9. Teresa Simmons On August the 16th of 2022, a former behavioral health counselor who'd worked at the Kent County Jail in Michigan was arrested for abusing a schizophrenic inmate during her employment. As detailed in a federal lawsuit launched by the victim who was seeking $250,000 in damages, his interaction with 43-year-old Teresa Simmons had started while he was in solitary confinement. The unnamed inmate reported that Simmons had pursued him undeterred by his mental illness which allegedly involved him seeing spirits and having three people living in his head. In his lawsuit, he claimed that during their first exchanges, Simmons wrote him a note in which she referred to herself as Mama and started ordering him to perform various intimate acts. Simmons would allegedly sometimes knock on his door with her chest exposed, and the inmate gave the authorities a detailed description of a tattoo above her breast. She eventually ordered him to perform intimate acts on himself as she watched and on her through a hole in her pants, promising to bail him out of jail and offering to bring him drugs and cigarettes. The health worker reportedly referred to the victim as her private slave. The man reported feeling that he had no choice but to give in to her advances and the abuse resulted in his mental health worsening. The authorities suspected that the illicit contact which was reportedly confirmed by surveillance footage, had occurred on several occasions in January of 2022. As of the latest updates on the case, Simmons was arrested for second-degree criminal conduct and held at Ionia County Jail on a $15,000 bond. Number 8. Lindsay Keir Leading up to the fall of 2016, British woman Lindsay Keir had been employed at HMP Northumberland for over two decades as a kitchen worker. On November the 27th, local law enforcement, acting on a tip, stopped Keir as she arrived at the prison for her shift. Officers told her she was arrested on suspicion of supplying 
Drugs and the kitchen worker surrendered a bag holding two large cereal boxes. One of them contained hundreds of capsules, including pregabalin, buprenorphine, and zopaclone, as well as three glass vials of an anabolic steroid and three SIM cards. Law enforcement also discovered nearly 2.2 pounds of the drug Spice. The other box was found to contain two cell phones, cannabis resin, cocaine hydrochloride, hundreds of grams of spice, along with 12 syringes and hypodermic needles. According to their value within the prison environment, the items confiscated from Keir were worth over $130,000. Keir was interviewed by law enforcement and claimed that she was relieved to have been caught, noting that her smuggling of illegal contraband had been going on for months. Keir told officers that although she'd been reluctant upon initially being approached by prisoners, she eventually sold her soul and got in too deep. The woman, at the time in her late 40s, blamed financial struggles for her foray into crime. In some cases, she was paid over $1,000 for a package and used the money she'd amassed to buy a mobility scooter for her father, a car for her daughter, and to make renovations around her home. One of the men for whom she'd operated as a smuggler was identified as lifer Gary Weldon, aged 34. He and Keir both admitted conspiracy to supply prohibited items into prison and possession with intent to supply former legal high spice, for which they were jailed for two years and eight months. The role that Keir had played in the operation only extended to making the deliveries. Ross Rie and Gavin Richardson, both in their 20s, were also arrested and received suspended sentences with community service for procuring the items and preparing the illicit packages at Weldon's behest. Investigators determined, however, that they didn't know the packages were heading to prison. Number 7. Alex Banter, Todd Scheffler, and Willie Hedden. In May of 2018 at the Western Illinois Correctional Center in Mount Sterling, an inmate was severely beaten by three of the prison guards in what was subsequently deemed an unprovoked attack. 65-year-old Larry Ervin was airlifted from the prison with a punctured colon, broken ribs, and other serious internal injuries. He needed surgery to remove a section of his bowel in the aftermath of the attack. Ervin passed away several weeks after the incident, and his death was ruled a homicide from blunt force trauma. Guards Alec Banter, Todd Scheffler, and Willie Hedden were charged in the aftermath. They'd moved Ervin to a segregation unit, where they brutally beat him while he was handcuffed behind the back, and posed no threat to them. Banter and Scheffler pled not guilty to charges of conspiracy to deprive of civil rights, deprivation of civil rights, obstruction of an investigation, falsification of documents, and misleading conduct. 42-year-old Hedden, entered a guilty plea and agreed to cooperate in exchange for lesser charges. Even so, the two counts of civil rights violations, which he admitted to, could see him sentenced to life in prison and fines of $250,000 each. The trial is ongoing. Number 6. Tina Gonzalez In 2021, a former corrections officer at the Fresno County Jail in California was jailed for seven months for engaging in an intimate relationship with an inmate. The identity of her lover wasn't released while Assistant Sheriff Steve McComas, one of Gonzalez's superiors, described her actions as the product of a depraved mind. It was reported that the woman who was in her mid-twenties cut a hole in her uniform so that it would be easier for her to have intercourse with an inmate in full view of at least 11 other detainees. She had worked at the jail from 2016 to 2019 and following a tip, staff launched an investigation into her activity. In addition to being intimate with the inmate, she had also endangered the lives of her colleagues by allegedly supplying him with razor blades, which can be used as a weapon in prison. Gonzalez had also provided him with a cell phone and informed him about cell inspections so that he could hide contraband. Even though she had violated her oath and ruined her career, according to McComas, Gonzalez showed no remorse after being caught and continued to engage in explicit phone calls with the inmate, boasted about the crimes she'd carried out. Number 5. Erica Whittingham In 2021, a former corrections officer was sentenced to three years in prison for getting involved with an inmate and helping him escape. Following the breakdown of her 11-year-long marriage, Erica Whittingham fell for violent robber Michael Sodden her lawyer later arguing that she was smitten with him. Sodden was considered too dangerous for public release 
having been sentenced as part of a gang that tied and beat up a 78-year-old man at his Dorset farm in 2011. Sodden and Whittenden met while she was a custody officer at HMP Dovegate in Staffordshire between 2017 and 2019. They developed a romantic relationship which continued even after Sodden was transferred to HMP Sudbury. To communicate, he used a contraband cell phone and she talked on a burner phone. On October the 1st of 2019, Sodden escaped by scaling the prison's fence and then fleeing in the car that had been waiting for him with Whittingham acting as the getaway driver. They remained in contact and met roughly eight times in various areas of the country while Sodden was on the run, with Whittingham paying for hotels, accommodation and other items that he needed while evading the authorities. Then from January to March of 2020, in the second part of his six months of freedom, Sodden started seeing another woman in the Bournemouth region. He was eventually arrested on March the 27th. Whittingham pled guilty to harboring an escaped prisoner and misconduct in public office while Sodden had six months added to his sentence for the escape. Number 4. Gladiator Fights at California State Prison In 2019, relatives of inmates at the California State Prison in Corcoran protested outside the facility for the extensive violence that their loved ones were allegedly forced to face while incarcerated. The main aggressors were members of the Fresno Bulldogs, who'd failed to uphold the truce and started attacking their rivals in the yard roughly a year prior. This caused 350 inmates to be placed on a modified program that restricted visitations and exercise time. Inmates' rights organization, the Incarcerated Workers' Organizing Committee, alleged that the guards were putting on gladiator fights by purposefully releasing rival gang members in the yard at the same time. They anticipated that the groups would brawl and thus could use their fighting as a justification for the continuation of the modified program. One of the protesters, who hadn't seen her husband in months, argued that the guards liked to see bloodshed, while the state's Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation denied that guards were setting inmates up to brawl. There have been past reports of gladiator fights at Corcoran. In 2000, eight guards were acquitted of similar charges after they'd been brought to trial in an FBI investigation. It was reported that they'd encourage prisoners to fight, only to sometimes end them by firing deadly shots. There were rumors of an extensive cover-up and silenced whistleblowers, but the acquittals were upheld. A few years prior, state legislative hearings underlined the brutality of Corcoran while an independent panel found that nearly 80% of the shootings were unjustified occurrences which the state never fully investigated. Number 3. Tashina Majors In 2020, a senior officer at Northern State Prison in Newark, New Jersey, was charged with second-degree assault for being romantically involved with an inmate. From November of 2019 to December of 2020, Tashina Majors had been bedding an inmate over whom, by virtue of her status, she had authority and disciplinary power. 42-year-old Majors' alleged misconduct was uncovered following a joint investigation by the Attorney General's Office of Public Integrity and Accountability and the New Jersey Department of Corrections Special Investigations Division. Majors had yet to comment on the allegations, but she took down her Facebook in the scandal's aftermath. If found guilty on the assault charge, she risked a fine of up to $150,000 as well as 5 to 10 years in a state prison. Hey, it's Carl. Be sure to subscribe and leave your comments in the comments section below and maybe, just maybe, we'll get your video going next. Number 2. Ralph Kepler In December of 2016, Teresa Keel was found nearly bludgeoned to death near her home in Long Beach, New York State. 56-year-old Keel had been repeatedly struck in the face with a metal barbell, which resulted in her losing an eye and suffering broken teeth as well as a partially collapsed skull. Keel was left in a vegetative state due to irreparable brain damage and died roughly two years later. Whoever had brutally attacked her was effective in covering their tracks. Intense investigative work by Long Beach and Nassau County Police Departments ultimately pointed to Keel's own daughter, Francesca, and her boyfriend, Ralph Kepler, as the ones behind the murder. Kepler, a corrections officer at Rikers Island, and his family had invested in a dating app developed by Keel and her son, 
A business dispute had been suspected as the main reason behind the killing, with Kepler feeling that Keel had squandered his investment and demanding his money back. Francesca then, in her late teens, aided her boyfriend in carrying out the attack on her mother. She installed a GPS tracker on Keel's car with email alerts informing her when the vehicle was close to her home or workplace. Kepler stalked the woman and ambushed her in the entrance corridor to her apartment complex, unleashing the savage attack that eventually ended her life. Francesca called a taxi that picked Kepler up from the scene of the crime. The police arrested him at Rikers Island, where his employment was promptly terminated. He was sentenced to 22 years after pleading guilty to second-degree murder, second-degree conspiracy and related charges while Francesca entered a guilty plea for second-degree manslaughter and was given a 13-year sentence. Straight after number one, we'll be lining up our previous episode about the top six criminals whose plastic surgery failed them. It was a very interesting release, so stick around if you haven't seen that one yet. Number one, Nancy Gonzalez. In January of 2007, Ronell Wilson became the first man to be sentenced to death by a federal jury in New York since the capital punishment had been reinstated in 1988. During a gun deal gone wrong a few years prior, Wilson, an alleged member of the Stapleton Crew street gang, executed two undercover NYPD detectives, searched their bodies and stole their car. When his death sentence was pronounced, the victim's families and other members of the police force responded with applause and cheers to which he reportedly reacted by sticking his tongue out at them. In 2010, his death sentence was vacated on appeal due to a legal technicality and he was moved to the Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn. It was there that in July of 2012, he had relations with prison guard Nancy Gonzalez, who was then in her late 20s. The consensual and illicit rendezvous had taken place in a staff bathroom. She became pregnant with Wilson's child and in 2013 gave birth to a son who they named Justice. After the tryst surfaced, Gonzalez lost the custody battle and the child was placed in foster care with her maternal aunt. At her trial, Gonzalez's defense lawyer argued that she'd been abused in her younger years and while serving in the military, which resulted in emotional instability, causing her to seek destructive relationships. She was reportedly involved with another inmate who wasn't named when she met Wilson. Gonzalez was ultimately sentenced to one year in prison. Prosecutors argued that Wilson had targeted and impregnated her in order to avoid ending up on death row again. He was nevertheless sentenced to death again before it was ultimately commuted to life without parole on the grounds that he was intellectually disabled, which made him ineligible for execution under the Eighth Amendment. In 2012, Colombian authorities apprehended Giovanni Reboledo, a member of the notorious Los Topos gang. Since its emergence in the region, the group has become known for taking part in various criminal activities, including kidnappings, robberies, extortion operations, and drug dealings. Following Reboledo's arrest and the resulting legal proceedings, the gangster was sentenced to 60 years in prison. However, before ever serving out his punishment, he managed to escape from custody. Reboledo subsequently took extensive measures to avoid being recaptured spending over $14,000 on drastic cosmetic surgeries, changing his physical appearance to that of a woman. He reportedly received breast implants, a buttocks enhancement, and a nose job, and started wearing women's clothes. After taking on his elaborate and expensive disguise, Reboledo began working as an escort under the alias Rosalinda during a routine stop and search in the Bahio Prado district of the northern coastal city of Barranquilla, law enforcement recognized the escaped convict and took him back into custody. Fingerprint analysis confirmed his identity and he was subsequently slated to serve his original prison sentence. Reports from the local press revealed that the ex Los Topos member was paraded in front of the media following his recapture. Number 5. Lenon Oliveira do Camo A violent Brazilian drug dealer by the name of Lenon Oliveira do Camo was arrested in 2018 
as part of a criminal organization in Manaus. The man known as Bileno had reportedly overseen an armed militia, set up a leisure club for drug dealers, and even diverted the course of a river to create a bathing spot, which authorities believed was used as a meeting place for dealers. Bileno had also taken on a leadership role within a gang based in Rio de Janeiro prior to his arrest for his various crimes which included homicide, drug trafficking, and burglary. The outlaw faced the possibility of spending over 60 years behind bars. In July of 2018, Beleno was transferred out of the state prison system and was held in Mossoró, Rio Grande do Norte, for four months. After that, he was allowed to return to his home state of Amazonas on house arrest. Taking advantage of the decreased surveillance, Beleno ultimately destroyed his ankle monitor and fled. He took on the alias Elon Sores Cardoso and underwent plastic surgery to his face. Over the next two years, the fugitive reportedly lived a lavish life near the beach in Calcaia, an upscale area in the northeast Brazilian state of Sierra. Then on October the 17th of 2020, his life on the run was brought to an unceremonious end as he was finally tracked down and arrested. His capture marked the end of a three-month joint investigation by the Amazonas Public Security Secretariat, the Narcotics Investigation Department, the Civil Police of Sierra, and the Civil Police of Amazonas. Number 4. Luis Carlos de Roca Over the course of three decades, Brazilian drug lord Luis Carlos de Roca established himself as the most powerful drug trafficker in Latin America, better known under the alias Whitehead. The man was sought by authorities in multiple countries, leading to him being dubbed the Pablo Escobar of Brazil. He was said to have accumulated roughly $100 million in profits through his illegal endeavors, reportedly moving $1.2 billion worth of cocaine to Europe, Africa, and the United States. Roca underwent plastic surgery to change his appearance, which aided his efforts to evade capture during his nearly 30-year reign atop the Brazilian drug trade. The police said he lived in the shadows to keep a low profile, but despite his discretion, he was finally arrested during the summer of 2017. The notorious kingpin had been living in Sorriso, in the western state of Mato Grosso, under the assumed name Vitor Luis de Moraes. Investigators compared old photographs of Roca to images of Moraes, ultimately determining that they were in fact the same person. Operation Spectrum, as the sting would come to be known, also led to the seizure of approximately $10 million worth of criminal assets, including farms, other real estate, luxury vehicles, and aircraft. On the day of Roca's arrest, he'd gone to his local bakery to pick up some bread. While he was waiting at the counter, however, he was ordered to get on the ground by two armed undercover agents. Although the suspect looked rather inconspicuous, dressed in a plain white t-shirt, shorts and flip-flops, with barely any money in his pocket, his arrest dismantled a massive cocaine empire and brought a decades-long manhunt to an end. Number 3. Sarahat Sawanjian On December the 2nd of 2022, Thai police issued a warrant for the arrest of 25-year-old Sarahat Sawanjian after customs officials uncovered over 2,000 grams of MDMA in a package addressed to him. Sarahat, a drug dealer, would later confess to purchasing the illicit substance on the dark web using cryptocurrency as payment. The man was ultimately able to escape from custody whereupon he underwent a so-called face-off procedure, an extensive cosmetic surgery meant to significantly alter one's appearance. Although the surgical work made him almost unrecognizable, law enforcement was eventually able to locate and re-arrest him at a condominium in the Bang Na district of Bangkok. Investigators had reportedly analyzed the distribution of MDMA to other sellers and buyers in the area. The substances were traced back to an individual described by witnesses as an attractive South Korean man named Ji Ming Seong. The latter, it ultimately emerged, was actually Sarahat, who purposefully tried to make himself look like a Korean national. He even allegedly planned to restart his life in the East Asian country despite not knowing the language. An undercover police officer infiltrated the suspect's distribution network and ascertained his location by way of a subordinate who inadvertently gave him up. 
Following Sarah Hatt's latest arrest in February of 2023, he was charged with the illegal import of narcotics. Number 2. Amado Carrillo Fuentes At the onset of his career in the Mexican drug trade, Amado Carrillo Fuentes was sent to the town of Onjinaga in Chihuahua to oversee the cocaine shipments of his uncle, Ernesto Fonseca Carrillo. Fuentes would go on to work alongside Pablo Escobar and the Cali Cartel in their efforts to smuggle drugs from Colombia to Mexico and the United States. Eventually, Fuentes seized control of the Juarez Cartel by assassinating his boss, Rafael Aguilar Guajardo. He came to be known as El Señor de los Cielos, or the Lord of the Skies. The nickname stemmed from the large fleet of jets he reportedly used to transport drugs. He financed the fleet by laundering money through Colombia. Pressure began to mount as US and Mexican authorities failed to arrest the drug lord, who owned a house in Morelos State that was only three blocks away from the governor's official residence. On July the 4th of 1997, as his notoriety was intensifying, Fuentes underwent facial plastic surgery and liposuction at Santa Monica Hospital in Mexico City. The procedures were supposed to alter his appearance enough for him to blend in with the general public and avoid detection by law enforcement. However, Fuentes ultimately died on the operating table after experiencing complications caused either by a certain medication or a malfunctioning respirator. A few months later, the two surgeons who performed the operation were found dead, encased in concrete inside steel drums, with their bodies showing signs of torture. It's believed that Fuentes' bodyguards had abducted and murdered the doctors for botching his surgery. Number 1. Tatsuya Ichihashi In October of 2006, British woman Lindsay Hawker began teaching English classes in Japan at the Koiwa branch of Nova, which at the time was the country's largest private English conversation school. On March the 24th of 2007, Hawker arranged to meet a young man named Tatsuya Ichihashi at a cafe in Chiba, east of Tokyo, for an English lesson. The pair later hitched a ride to Ishihashi's apartment in a taxi. Hawker asked the cabbie to wait outside for a few minutes while she briefly accompanied her student inside. However, after seven minutes had passed, the 22-year-old failed to materialize. So the driver left. When Hawker didn't show up for any of her classes over the next two days, Nova reported her missing to the authorities. Two police officers were sent to Ichihashi's residence but weren't permitted to knock on the door without probable cause. Two hours later, Ichihashi emerged from the apartment to find that a total of nine officers had congregated outside his front door. He fled with a rucksack slung over his shoulder, and although the officers gave chase, he ultimately escaped. On the balcony of Ichihashi's apartment, the police found a bathtub filled with a mixture of compost soil and sand. Hawker's unclothed and lifeless body had been buried in the bath after having been bound and gagged with plastic ties and scarves. What ensued was a two and a half year manhunt for Ichihashi that came to involve upwards of 140 law enforcement officials. The man was ultimately captured in Osaka while trying to board a ferry to Okinawa in November of 2009. In court, he would go on to confess that he'd suffocated Hawker to prevent her from screaming while he assaulted her in his apartment on the day of their lesson. In the summer of 2011, the Chiba District Court sentenced Ichihashi to life in prison for the crime. Earlier that year, the man had written a memoir from behind bars detailing his life on the run as well as the great lengths he'd gone to in order to avoid police detection. The book, titled Until I Was Arrested, revealed that Ichihashi had bound up his nose with a thread and needle like a cook trussing a piece of meat to make it thinner. Additionally, the fugitive twice tried to remove a portion of his lower lip to make it appear more narrow. He also dug two moles out of his cheek with a box cutter and routinely wore several layers of surgical masks to conceal his face in public. Ichihashi admitted to becoming obsessed with plastic surgery in his bid to evade capture. A cosmetic surgery clinic in Nagoya had gone to the police to inform them that Ichihashi had undergone a procedure which ultimately contributed to his eventual arrest. Thanks for watching.